you can start sir you can sir good afternoon friends welcome to this tuesday afternoon webinar we are all eager to listen to dr uh, anand thakur sir on external fixation we have all had listened to his first talk on plating principles then on nailing principles and today he'll be speaking to us on external fixation external fixator we quite often use in orthopedics in difficult situations for planning as pre operative spanning fixation and in many difficult compound fracture fixation it has various usage he'll be taking us with the principles and how to dynamize or reverse dynamize so we'll be eager to listen to him welcome dr anand thakur sir for this webinar uh, we also have dr nk saxena hod and head of the department x uh, from nagpur medical college we welcome you dr nk saxena sir alok umre would be shortly joining and all the questions will be posed to dr alok umre his number is already given on to the web information and uh, i welcome dr ashok sham the webmaster for telecasting this webinar most welcome all of you so welcome on this tuesday afternoon welcome anand thakur sir can we have your presentation sir good afternoon on the fourth tuesday of this lockdown period which we hope shall end in about 10 or 12 days time however we may have a opportunity to meet one more time but before we let's make the best of the opportunity today external fixation is a very powerful tool in hands of orthopedic surgeons and one is in dire trouble like grade 3b uh, open wounds of tibia or femur then what we first think of is external fixation because there is no way one could go inside and stabilize the fractures through internal fixation so external fixation was started or well recognized uh, uh, frame was made by lambo in year 1900 lambo was a very versatile person he he, he used to make his own plates and screws also he made a violin he was a good violin player he also made violins for himself and other people uh, that didn't pick up very much but the real boost to external fixator came with roy raul hoffman in 1950 This is Raoul Hoffman. He he got connected with the industrial house, and then he prepared his external fixator, which became very popular in Europe. It was extremely popular. Didn't spread much outside, but it was very very well used. <coughs> Later in sixties, uh, far remote Siberia, none other than it is Harrow devised this uh, circular frame. which was entirely different than what raul hoffman was uh, planning was using however the effectivity of both were very very good ao then came in 70s and then modified the uh, hoffman's uh, external fixator and presented their own version of the fixator which became very very popular after that we have had many other innovations monotube in 1980s from italian surgeons then we had hybrid uh, fixation from american surgeons and then later on they got what is now known as modular frame from surgeon from mexico we shall deal with that in due course of time so we have this variety of these things but basically as you must have noticed there are two systems in external fixator one has got pins rods and clamps and other one has got rings wires and extensors so we are going to confine ourselves only to pins rods and clamps uh, we are not going to do anything with the uh, with the frame the circular frame fixators they are themselves a uh, big domain and uh, it would take more than two lectures to cover that part so we will just uh, use the opportunity to talk about the pins clamps and rods the other reason to use this or uh, talk about this is this is handy this is easier to use so in real emergency one would be prone to use this kind of fixator rather than the ring fixator 
Ring fixator usually is for plant surgeries. <coughs> One needs a lot of time to really organize the frame beforehand. In emergency situation, you have to do it on the spot. You have to improvise, which is possible in pin rod and clamp system. So we'll discuss that today. <laughs> These are the basic elements of the uh, system. You have a pins, half pins, or regular standman pins. Half pins go, as the name says, only halfway through the bone, while standman pins would go right across. Then they are held in a clamp so that they don't move about or they could be used there. And those clamps in two different areas are attached to a central body. It may be a rod, it may be a tube or maybe some other device, which may have some capacities to compress or distract, or even just to hold it like this. So this is the main the basic structure of the pin fixator. Pins are, of course, more important. And when we dealt with screw, we talked a lot about that. And we have got the tip and the cutting edge, as I said last time as well. This is the business end. This big furrow is only to remove the material from the bone face. Just throw it back so the pin doesn't get jammed. We get a lot of varieties of pin tips and all of them are available. They are almost the same. Uh, and <clears throat> nothing much one which is available with your hospital is good enough. Uh, these are actually pictures uh, and there's some varieties I've described, self-drilling pin. Uh, blunt pin, cancellous spin, and transfixation pin. Like with screw, one has to make a pilot hole and then has to insert this uh, screw or shan screw or a pin. Uh, they're all synonyms. Why shan screw? It was called, I don't know, because the threads were there at one end, but it doesn't function anything like a screw. It just takes a purchase on both the cortices and thus provides a handle with which you can move the fragments. It does not compress any parts, or if you put it across two fragments, it's not going to compress it. So, but the screw, the Shan screw name has come to stay, and we are all using, we are comfortable, we don't confuse them with locking screw or a cancel screw or nothing. Now, when we insert a screw, if we just make an exact hole and pass the screw, uh, pass the shan screw or pass the pin here, what would happen? Uh, we have done nothing else except made a pilot hole and pass the screw. Whenever there is loading, then the bone will move in one side and there will be a gap on the other side. When it happens the other way around, when the load is from the opposite direction, the reverse would take place. Though uh, while you are inserting, it looks very well clean fitting. However, with load, uh, with weight bearing, it will uh, wobble, it will, uh, will go to one side or the other side. That means it will de deform the bone. So gradually, with repeated deformation, the hole will become big. The screw will lose its grip on the bone matrix. Eventually, it will start wobbling and will come out. Not a happy situation if you want to use that external fixator for a length of time. So what we can do, uh, this is uh, how the, once the moment occurs, the <coughs> osteoclast osteo start working both at the end, uh, at the periphery or also at the endosteal level and at both edges because of the moving the osteophytes, uh, osteoclast will destroy the bone and eventually the pin will become loose, it will wobble, that because of the movement, it will get infected and there will be debacle. <clears throat> what one could do is after passing the screw in an exact proper hole, one could pre-stress it. That means put it to one side against the cortex so it is under some kind of load. That is technically called as pre-loading. So pre-loading can be done that we push it to one side and hold it in a clamp. So whenever there is a load uh, from this direction, the pin will move, but to a lesser extent. When it happens the other way around, also it will move, but to a lesser extent. 
uh, this is a definitely improvement on the previous condition where no preload was applied. But this is a next stage, a plane load by pressing, by, by compressing the pins against each other or against the clamp will be done. So there is a some kind of pressure between the pin and the board. And this pre-stressing or pre-loading will counteract the, the loads which will be affecting the fixator when the patient walks or moves his limb. <coughs> but when the, uh, the loading is from the opposite direction, there will be some movement. All in all, it is an improvement, but it is not the best thing. In good time, the hole will become big and the loosening will occur. So preloading is a step ahead, but it is not the best thing. What could do we do next? Engineers always help us. So they devised a method, what is called as radial preloading. In this, what happens is a pilot hole is made, but the pin is tapered. The distal end of the pin is narrow, and the one which is going to abut into the proximal uh, cortex is wider. So it's a tapering pin. The tip of the pin is, uh, say, five millimeter, and where the threadings end, it is going to be six millimeters. So as we pass the pin, it will bite into the bone and will have, will produce a mechanical condition, what is called as a radial preloading. So the pressure is on all sides. So now when there is a uh, external loading or a patient takes weight, then the, this pin will not move in either direction because it is tied on all sides. Earlier pins were tied only at one cortex. So when there was loading from the opposite cortex, there would be movement. But in this situation, it is only loaded from all cortex. So let the external load come on this side or this side. It is always protected because it is pre-stressed radially. So external deforming loads from any other direction will still hold up. This is now supposed to be the best method. And whenever possible, one should use uh, unscrews or pins with tapering tips so that you can get an axial preload every time you apply a clamp. Uh, the earlier method of pre-stressing it by compressing has fallen behind and uh, it's, not, it's being used less and less. I won't say it's not being used at all. It's used, being used less and less. <clears throat> now all this preloading, what one would say to get a good preload use a very narrow pilot hole and put a big screw inside, you'll get the best preload. It doesn't happen like this. There is a mathematical relation between what you can do. If you, it's a too small a pilot hole and you use a very large screw, there will be micro fractures and the pin will be loose from the word go. So the junction or the force that acts between the bone and the screw is called interference. And there is a mathematics to, uh, to calculate it. Um, I can read it out, but it, uh, as a surgeon, it doesn't make much difference to me. Uh, those who are mechanically oriented or mathematically oriented, they can uh, work on this formula and then find out the interference. In practical terms, it's good to follow what the manufacturer of the Shan spin tells you. We said use 4.5 drill bit for a pilot hole, then use 4.5 drill bit because he has worked on the interference. He wants that interference fit and he would have made the threads, the threads and the major and minor diameter so that the precise pilot hole of that recommended drill will fit best and you will get the best uh, things out of his decision. Here is a whole list of uh, drill bits, uh, pilot holes and then uh, pin diameters so that interference is good. Overall, the difference between the uh, pilot hole and the outer rib is usually 0.1 milli one millimeter, not more than that. More, uh, 0.1 millimeter, if more than that, there could be trouble. But safer is to follow what the manufacturer has said. As here is the list for Alna, we use three, uh, and humerus, we use four, for TBF5 and femur 6. 
So this kind of table should be handy and one should follow this, uh, trying to do other things would be usually land us up in more trouble. <clears throat> Whatever wonderful fit we produce by using exact pilot hole and the, the latest threading interference uh, screw, still the health of the bone is of paramount importance. If the bone is fragile, like in osteoporosis, when the patient takes weight, and there is a loading on that, it will give way. The screw will be intact, it will work very well, but the bone will reach its tolerance of resisting this kind of load, will break down and the pin will loosen. So getting the best interference pin is not a certificate or a license to walk without restrictions. The surgeon as well as the, as the patient should be in tandem. Surgeon should assess the, assess the uh, quality of the bone of the patient and then advise him accordingly. In a young patient, you can allow uh, higher weight bearing, but in elderly people, it's always good to give them a caution, put less, wait uh, till the fracture heals because otherwise the external fixator will come loose. Quality of bone is very important. Similarly, the fracture configuration. If there's a comminuted fracture, then entire load of the construct is falling on the screws and only on the bone, uh, this interface between screw and the bone. So, if it is a load carrying uh, implant, if there is combination, there is no contact between the load carrying, entire load will be on the screws and should put less weight so that the, the screw plate interference will continue for a longer time. Uh, I showed three ways of putting screws. Uh, um, this is partly threaded screw, it has got hold on the distal fragment and no hold on the proximal fragment. These screws are usually used for uh, preloading by compression and uh, uh, they are not being used anymore. Or they're being used less and less. Uh, what you could notice or somebody may ask that if the screw is six millimeter at this end and five millimeter at this end, is it not weak up in this area? When we work out the mechanism, the loading, um, loading the load on the proximal cortex is far more than the load on the distal cortex. The load, uh, what the bending load on the proximal cortex is far more than the bending load on the distal cortex. Hence, if we use a smaller diameter screw, it will not matter. It will carry us through. That's why this tapered screw or tapered uh, drill bit makes two advantages. It produces the radial fit or the radial interface and a radial preload, sorry, that is the right one, and produces radial preload both at the far cortex and also at the uh, near cortex as well. <coughs> if, there is a, if there is a, if the screws don't hold completely, then there is a danger of it breaking at this point. But if the if the other things are taken care of, then it's very rare for the pin to break. Any, uh, so they just for typical purposes, I show you that it breaks. In practice, these days, uh, pins don't break so easily. They're quite uh, sturdy. So this is the interference fit or radial preload on both sides using a, um, using a, a tapered screw. What else can we do? Here's a tempered screw, which will engage only in the far cortex. You can see the diameter here is less. Here it is more, so it will have a radial press fit. To improve that, the threads could be coated with hydroxyapatite. In an event that one wants to keep for about four to six weeks or even longer, then one could use the hydroxyapatite coated screws and that definitely improves the hold. 
in an osteoporotic bone also it is worth trying. Hydroxyapatite, as you know, has stood the test of time. In hip joint uh, coating, uh, stem coating is very well uh, worked out and it's, it's very satisfactory. So that has also been adopted here and for long term, coated pins are quite useful. This may come to the other element called clamps. As you can see, there are two types. This one will take only one single screw, a single pin or a screw, while this one will take three or four. This is the design from Hoffman's. This was the original one, and this is from Synthes. I used this in the 90s for quite some time, almost five, six years I was regularly using it. The older model, now newer models are very fancy and very more efficient as well. But this uh, is quite good. One has to use two or three pins in a bulb, and then this clamp is applied. That makes it a very, very sound uh, holding on the fragment, and then it will go. This is the synthesis clamp, which is also very versatile. Uh, this end clamp uh, catches the clamp with the big hole there. And this end, here there is a, uh, hole for the pin. Now, this clamp can be independently tightened with this nut on the clamp, and with this nut, the screw can be tightened here, and this portion can rotate on the square portion here. So it has movement and flexibility in several directions and works very well. It's very efficient. This is also very efficient with newer additions. They are put in ball bearings here. With that the, these ball can also be turned. So both the systems are very efficient and very well worked out. Once we give engineers some problem, they really work it out and make our life extremely uh, comfortable. Photographs. So this is the old type of Hoffman frame, and uh, you can see it is being applied as a bilateral frame. Something we don't do these days. But uh, in 70s and 80s, this was a popular frame for uh, severe fracture. This is the synthesis clamp. Okay. These are the new Hoffman type, uh, not necessarily Hoffman company, but something like that. Multiple pins can be applied here and things like that. And this is something like the uh, synthesis clamp, only thing it can take two screws. And uh, then this is for bone transport. There is a sleeve on the top of this, and there's a nut, so the bone transport can take place with the help of these screws. So several new things have come up. The third element is the rod. You can see the pins are held with these clamps, and the clamp, all three clamps are attached with the rod, yellow rod. Again, you can see the rods come into various lengths, and they can be used. So, once these are connected, then the pins become very stabilized and a handle like this if it's connected here, then the entire frame becomes very, very strong and stable. So very versatile engineering piece, and uh, we have also learned to use it very well with us. So this is the outline of, of our construct. We have various items that could affect the stability or the rigidity of the of the construct. We want uh, the external pixel to be strong. So how we can make it strong or very stable is all these factors. Number and orientation of the sidebars, the span of the, from the sidebar to the pin, the length of the pin which is exposed, how far the pins are away from each other, how far the bar is away from each other, and how the bones are separated. We'll take up uh, these items one by one. <coughs> uh, certain, certain systems now provide bars of different sizes. Synthesis provides only of one size, but uh, the other systems provide a thicker bar or thinner bar. So one can have a choice, and if one has applied a thin bar and feels it's not a good condition, it requires something else, an additional bar could be put in there and it, become, it increases the stability. So a thicker bar or two bars of the same of a thinner variety will improve the stability of the construct. Number. Again, if the pins 
and the bars are in the direction of the of the force that caused the fracture it is in the same plane as the plane of the fracture then it will be strongest if it is at 90 degrees to the to the plane of the force that caused the fracture it will be the weakest and between the plane and the 90 degrees it will be half and half we'll talk about the plane of the fracture uh, a little later but one the orientation of the pins at the sidebar could make difference in the stability of the fracture the pin span and sidebar skin application pin span is the distance between the bone and the clamp longer the distance more flexible is the fixator closer the distance more rigid is the fixator so if you want it to move it be more flexible you just move the clamps a little away and it will become more flexible if you find that it is very very it's too much of a, a flexibility then you can move the bars and the clamps a little closer shorten the span of the screw of the pins this will become stiffer the fixator will become a little stiff it will not flex it will not give any interfragmentary movement so the pin span and the sidebar again there is a limit how close you can bring the sidebar if you bring it too close then one may not be able to do dressings if the the clamps are applied immediately after injury then one should anticipate some event some kind of swelling and should keep enough space so that the skin is not affected however uh, usually two to three centimeters is uh, minimum that is required one should not go very close otherwise uh, skin management uh, around the pin becomes a problem and it is fine and it's not also necessary <coughs> pin separation the distance between the two pins uh, is what matters and that will control the movement that the stability of the fracture as a rule we want near near and far far near near means the two pins should be as near to the fracture side as possible and two pins should be as far as the from the fracture so in one fragment one pin should be near the fracture and the other pin should be as far from the fracture longer the span stronger is the hold of this fixator on this bone closer is the span more likely it will pivot or it will be weaker uh, weaker construct if you consider this the, between these two this is a stronger construct this is a weaker construct so pin separation is important i said near near how near the fracture side we can go one does not want to enter the fracture hematoma with this pin otherwise there is chance of getting infection in the fresh case we don't want all that trouble so on an average one should gauge how big would be the hematoma but about 2 cm distance should be reasonable as a rule of thumb but one has to make a decision right on the spot depending on what you see there if there is a huge hematoma then avoid going through the hematoma otherwise it will cause the uh, and as far as away is possible longer the distance good uh, but one should not enter very close to the joints or bone below so somewhere in the metaphysis is a good distance to go through apart from these factors uh, the quality of the bone uh, the external fixator will hold well in a young strong bone in osteoporotic bone it will have problem patient compliance is also important it is not external fixator is just a device to hold the bones together temporarily it is not the final solution um, it is usually applied in emergency situation so patient has to be told how much weight he can put on that external fixator also patient should follow what the doctor has told him if he over does it a chance that the external fixator will break down there will be trouble if there is movement at the pin site then infection is likely and the the and the oh, the pin will become loose one will have to take uh, 
care of the external fixed angle both at the pin skin junction because that is a spot where there could be trouble all the time but also in the clamps the clamps are, are they usually wear down there is a creep you would have on the first day tightened it to your best but after three four days if you try, try again you will be able to again tighten that by a fraction because there is a creep it tends to get loosened and it's a it's a mechanical problem all engineers are sure about how it happens so they would take care of it but we should also learn that uh, when left alone the fixator may become loose so one should occasionally tighten the nuts and all the parts so that the it is maintained after care of the fixator is also important so with this what can we create we can create different frames and we have got good names for them what we start with unilateral uniplanar plane the green side is the plane and is unilateral that means only the fixed is one side and this is rod here so this is unilateral in one plane unilateral uniplanar fixed this frame has got rods on both sides and a standing pin is going across so it is bilateral but still in one plane so we call it bilateral uniplanar that two uh, two identities whether it has got one rod or two rod or whether it is one plane or two way so it is bilateral uniplanar <coughs> this is unilateral and biplanar we have got only single rods but in two different planes there is nothing going across like this so it's not bilateral it is one 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 here one here but in different planes so two rods they are connected here this kind of plane makes the strongest configuration in the present condition unilateral biplanar frame <coughs> unilateral biplanar and we just discussed that and this is bilateral biplanar now uh, is bilateral and biplanar again these planes are not any longer use particularly bilateral by bilateral play uh, frames are no longer used they are very popular on more time and these these kind of configurations were used for quite some time and uh, you would even see that there is a interflex screw allowed um, these drawings were from the references in 90 80s and 90s today uh, nobody is going to put a frame interflex screw here Uh, and this has a very good reason for it. So these frames are no longer used, uh, just for historical importance. I have got <coughs> patients who are being treated in this kind of uh, configuration in Berlin, fairly uh, awe-inspiring and daunting. And uh, but it was this is what is was happening here. So the issue with the uh, fixator was once the fixator was in place it was difficult to get a reduction here there was no mechanism to move this uh, without an assistor or something so it was very difficult and all the clamps were on one rod so when they were on one rod there was no lateral side to side movement so one could not move the fragments independently so achieving reduction was a problem <clears throat> most fixed are unilateral or bilateral on a single rod system single rod was the trouble that's why they fell into disrepute because they were less useful this surgeon from modeled as a modular frame and that has become now the state of art that is the one we use all the time what is a modular frame he said to create a stable base by putting two pins in each segment and connect them to with to, with rods so that it becomes a piece it becomes like a an handle and using two handles we can then reduce the fracture uh, this is his way uh, he was using a clamp which would take two pins and you could do on one side and with these two handles it was possible to 
uh, move them on different uh, one could freely put screws uh, anywhere they like or whenever it's convenient or technically possible and then when these two things are there they gain the reduction and then attach it with a rod and that made the frame so now it was possible to reduce the fracture with the external pixel gun also maintain the position after reduction only change same equipment but change of thought change of uh, technique and that has become extremely versatile and very useful stuff graphic representation two pieces now can be easily manipulated and the reduction once achieved can be held by applying this good rod and things will be comfortable repetition makes the things uh, more clear or uh, better so there are some more of this thing the two separate pins and tubular so that you have control on these two ones and then they can be once you get the reduction apply a clamp in whatever position it takes it hold and the reduction will be stable so for surgeons in a hurry in an emergency room this frame is a great asset till it was devised it was a tedious job a tough job to get things right we had to first get the reduction and then try and part the pin time it wasted uh, it also um, it was more assault on the patient but once this modular frame came in it becomes a child's play a houseman's show in the upper limb one has to be careful about the nerves and so you can space the uh two handles and then connect them as required for the necessary stuff more designs uh, just for fancy stuff uh, this is the standard one and if one felt that this was not adequate uh, some mobility additional rod could be uh, placed there as i said more the rods more the stability this fixation would be far more sturdier than this fixation so uh, more rods more stability beamer again the the basic handles are put in two different uh, planes and is connected by this rod it makes it extremely stable spanning uh, we all are very familiar with this spanning and for that there are three designs of spanning that i shown here uh, these are mainly for around the knee injuries and a span like this would stabilize the, uh, the injured part and one can carry on with the soft tissue work uh, till the definitive treatment can be taken out. So when it comes to applying frame, is it, uh, is it just a standard way or a TBL, say just anterior medial frame and that should be fine? Well, it is like this. If one applies the frame in the direction of the force that caused the fracture, in the same plane as the force that caused the fracture, the, the holding or the frame would be strongest. Once the fracture occurs, the deformity, whatever it happens, will recur if the fixation fails and will go back to the same original position which caused the fracture. So direction of the force or direction of the load that caused the basic fracture is very important to know for the surgeon so that he can place the fixator in the same plane so that he creates a very strong fixation and supports the broken fracture without the risk of its failure. Now, how to find uh, the plane of the uh, plane of the fracture or the plane of the force that caused the fracture? See, most of the fractures are caused by bending load. When the bending occurs, a butterfly also comes in. So the apex of the butterfly is on the tension side of the force. The apex of the but the butterfly is usually triangular. So the base of the butterfly is on the compression side of the force. Apex on the tension side, the base on the compression side. 
we'll first see a, a, a mechanical experiment. This beam is four point loaded. Uh, there are two loading parts, and this this is being continuously pressed, and it is already developing cracks here. The four point bending is something that is very common in life, and the tibia usually breaks with a four point bending. So more load and the thing breaks, you get a fracture here and a butterfly here. So on the tension side, you've got a fra transverse fracture and the oblique fracture comes on the compression side, so is the butterfly. <sighs> the transverse fracture is on the compression side and the oblique butterfly is on the uh, sorry, the transverse fraction, the tension side, the butterfly is on the other side. So once you see an uh, X-ray, you can make out which is the tension side, which is the compression side, merely looking at the direction of the bone butterfly. In life, also you can see here it's very similar. You have got a fracture here. There's a compression side, and you have got the butterfly here. Apex points to tensile force and the base denotes the compression side. Now, by examining the X-ray, we can find this out. Now, this is the AP picture and the butterfly is on the medial side and the apex is on the lateral side. So the, plane, the apex is on the coronal plane on this side. Let's see the lateral picture, we don't see the butterfly at all. That means the force was in the coronal plane. Now, if you apply the fixator in the coronal plane, then it will be the strongest. This is the medial side, we applied the coronal plane uh, from the lateral side. And by this way, we are nullifying the tension force, which is against here. We are, we are holding it here, so the tension is taken care of. So this configuration for a butterfly like this, which is heading uh, laterally, uh, dead laterally in the coronal plane, you will put the, play, uh, the fixator in the coronal plane and that will be the strongest fixation that you can offer. In AP, you don't see the butterfly, but you see the lateral plane. That means the force was acting in the uh, sagittal plane from front to back. That's why the point was here, which cannot be seen, and the butterfly went there, the base is posteriorly. So this is sagittal plane. The force was acting in the sagittal plane. We put our frame also in the sagittal plane, thus making the most stable frame index. We are nullifying the force, which is work, which was working like this. We are just neutralized that. It was simple with two ways. The third X-ray is something like this. Now, uh, here is a, <clears throat> the force was in this was a, acting from anterior medial to posterior lateral side. So, in AP, you see a butterfly with the anterior medial beak and the base posterior lateral. The lateral means it confirms that it is a posterior lateral beak. So, the frame should be in the anterior medial side. Anterior medial plane is possible. We have the subcutaneous surface of tibia. You apply a plane at 45 degrees. That would be the best because the force was acting in the 45 degrees to coronal and sagittal plane, which is at 45 degrees, which is our most favorite one. It will work best if the butterfly is anterior, uh, which is butterfly is like this. Um, on the lateral side and for this thing. So it would work very well there. <clears throat> and you can see this cross section of the TB at that time. You have had plenty of bone available, which is subcutaneous, easy to insert pins here on the medial side, and you can get this anterior medial flame. So, force acting from anterior medial to posterior lateral side. You apply the plane, uh, the, uh, the frame in the anterior medial side. Now, we have got something which is now we see the force is acting from anterior lateral to posterior medial side. So, a butterfly is on the medial side and also on the posterior side. Butterfly is posterior, medial and posterior. So, 
it is difficult to apply a frame either anterior medial or posterior medial it is not possible so what we we cannot if we apply plane on the medial side like we usually do it will be weak because it will be at 90 degrees to the line of force which caused the fracture that if the four if we apply a plane like this like in the previous one and the force is acting entirely at 90 degrees will be the weakest and uh, the fixation will fail so and there is no way we can do it in the plane so we have to use two frames then uh, something like this which is called as delta frame here we are applied one in the most convenient place on the medial side and the another one at the slightly oblique on this side and then connected to that this becomes very strong plane and now it will take care of the forces um, which are actually in this case from anterior lateral to posterior medial side it will take care so with the looking at the x-ray and the position of the butterfly where the apex is headed where the base is one can work out what was the force what was the plane of the force that caused that fracture and then place the external fixator in that plane so you get the strongest possible fixation it may be for a short time or it may be for a long time but when you apply as the orthopedic surgeon it must be the right thing you can't just take for every fracture you apply on the subcutaneous of the tibia 25 percent of the time you will be right uh, <laughs> because that will be the plane of the fracture but in other three instances it will loosen up and you will wonder why it happened. Once you remember all these uh, directions, the plane of the force that caused the fracture of the butterfly positions, it will be very easy for you to work it out. <coughs> limbs in 82, uh, they classified the limbs as eccentric and concentric. It depends on whether the muscle mass is on one side or it is surrounding the bone as such. The classical examples are tibia and ulna, and you can see in subcutaneous surface is very easy. It is very easily approachable, so one can easily pass the screws and then make it like this. Uh, while in femur or in humerus, surrounded by all sides, so it could cause trouble, or one has to have specific points where you will cause minimum trouble. So the limbs, the classified as the concentric and eccentric. Uh, ones which are placed in eccentric limb segments, they can last longer without any trouble when it's concentric. Usually two to three weeks is the limit, but then the trouble could start and one has to take special precaution. Here is the tibia, which is showing the uh, cross sections at different level. Here there is a different configuration, but you get a wide range and then almost put it to 180 degrees, while in the middle section, you have got only a 40, 50 degrees uh, thing here, but lower down again, you get a larger one to do that. So atlases are available for all limbs and to show the safe corridors as they are called, through which you can pass the pins without causing any kind of damage. And they should be consulted before you can uh, undertake an external fixation. Uh, particularly in female, there are vessels and nerves, but once you know where they are, um, safe external fixation can be carried out. But in female, longer than three weeks, there could be trouble. And then one needs to then resort probably to the uh, wire fixators for a longer time or hybrid ones, uh, or use a pin with coating so that it will last longer or take special care or whatever. So when it comes eccentric limbs, if the surface is subcutaneous, safe zones exist, joint stiffness of the concentric joints is less and pin track infections are less. On the concentric limbs, there is no subcutaneous surface. There are no safe zones. Uh, joint sort of stiffness uh, is quite common. Pin track infection is increases after three weeks and they are preferred for a short duration. So this is the basic uh, mechanics 
or the skills required, knowledge required to employ an external facilitator. I'm not going into details of insertion of pen and applying the torque and all those things because they have been discussed before and in one piece you can't take everything. I just stayed with the general principles. And as they say, the mind that knows the principle can find his own ways. So if there are any questions for whatever you are discussing, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, sir, for taking us through principle. And I, I presume that there would be a lot of uh, questions. Yes, Alok, sir. Uh, do we have questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Sir, in the case of tibia uh, application of fixator, where do you apply on the lateral surface? When do you apply to the lateral surface yeah. of tibia? Of tibia. On tibia, you don't have to. I just uh, explained to you that you had to analyze the direction or the plane of the load or the force that destroyed the bone. Once you establish that, you try and put it in that uh, plane. And if it is like where you cannot plane, like the anterior lateral to posterior medial, where you cannot place, put the fixator. Put the dual plate, uh, put the yeah. delta plate, I delta think plate. That, uh, and you will uh, get by that. So you don't have to uh, take any risk, you don't have to damage anything. Use a biplanar play, uh, plate and get the fixation. Yeah, another question is there. Yeah, okay. so, so, should we, as yes, you explained about the weight bearing protocol, so should we allow partial weight bearing? After the application of external fixator, or so, uh, fixator is to give stability to the bone till it heals. It is not a device to make the patient walk. The uh, when the AO, AO promoted the internal fixation or now external fixation is to keep the limbs and the joints mobile. That doesn't mean that uh, they want them to run marathon on the next day. So weight bearing is a judgmental thing. It depends on the uh, configuration of the fracture, the nature of the soft tissue, the, the, the personality of the patient, and other factors, general condition, etc., etc. I am in no great hurry to make patients walk, but I am in a hurry to make them mobile in the bed, from bed to chair, and from chair to the bathroom. That kind of mobility is my top priority. Whether you can walk down the street or the aisle is another story. I would go by, by, by on case on case basis and not suffer the stability at any time. So the answer is most straightforward. You have to make your own judgment depending on all the factors that I discussed just now. Uh, Alok, can we have an uh, opinion from Dr. Saxena? Yes, he, yes, he used uh, external fixator quite a lot in uh, medical college uh, experience. So can we ask you, Dr. Saxena, sir, how uh, did you allow weight bearing as tolerated or what was your protocol? This was in the 70s and 80s. And that time, <clears throat> we have started with the ring fixator. And the ring fixator was very strong. And it gave a multiple uh, fixing stability. And therefore, the weight bearing could be started very early, even next day. Since it is in the multiple plane, and all the forces are, are sort of parallel by using the four uh, rods in the rings, we made the parallelogram. And therefore, the forces are not acting at the fracture side right. when the patient is load uh, uh, weight bearing. So that I, I always preferred ring fixator. I was very comfortable with the ring fixator. Any type of can yeah. be done. Any infirmity can be corrected. Fracture can be reduced. And early weight bearing can be. Some of the advantages compliance patient compliance. I mean, it looked very sort of um, complicated, and therefore, patient to continue with this uh, was okay. rather uh, difficult. But then it could be used even as a final treatment. Not only that, the other fixator, you will find that you have to change it to a definite fixation device at a later date. But the ring fixator can continue till the fracture heals. This has been my experience. Okay. 
Thank you very much, sir. Alok, do we have another question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There's a yeah. question from Baroda. Dr. Kishan is asking ki in tibia or femur, LRS fixator for dynamization of bone to consolidate, which clamp screw we lose anterior, which are holding pins or posterior from railroad side? Uh, dynamization is to come. Uh, we will take that. It would be coming in the next section. Dynamization at a little later stage. Okay. It is part okay. of the talk, but later. Okay. I think he might be hearing. Yes, sir. Yeah, you want to say something? Yes, sir. Yeah. You talked about have you talked about the butterfly fragment? Now some of the fracture are not having a butterfly fragment. They are slightly oblique or transverse, or they are segmental. So there, how to detect the compression site and the the for the fixation uniplanar fixation? Yeah, these are just guidelines. In a particular case, one can always make out in transverse. That means there was a purely bending force. But still, right. it will give us uh, some hint by way of soft tissue injuries or the history or the way it happened that one can make it out to how it is. The idea of giving these examples was to uh, initiate the thought in that line. Today, what happens when it comes to a TBR is a fine anterior medial surface, let's put it and get out in five minutes. Wonderful. But before that, if you just plan that, well, if I put it in sagittal, or coronal plane in this particular case, probably it's fine. Or in this particular case, I need to put a delta. That is your... So this was just to thought process, nothing yeah. more. It's just an example. You can't give every situation in this, but right. just to initiate the thought. Yeah. Right. So there are another question. Yeah, go ahead, Alok. Yeah. Sir, uh, in case of you uh, explain about the drill bits, and use of pins. So can we use a smaller size drill bit for a normal, the, say, 3, 4.5 mm uh, screw? Say, three? No, no. Say, we should follow the manufacturer's instructions. Because that, this screw and drill bit, this is all mechanical stuff. This is all very scientifically organized. We should not fiddle with uh, doing this. Otherwise, with in that drill bit, you may be real pilot hole, you may be able to force your screw with all your might, but you would produce micro fractures and your shan screw or the standard screw will be loose. It may not be apparently loose right at the table, but it will certainly fall off in a very short time. So if the manufacturer says use 4.5, then don't use 3.8, use 4.5 only or not 5.2. The what he says you should follow, then you get the best results. So there is my opinion yes. that it is to be followed. So do we go to the next section, Alok? Or, uh, so one, more, one more question is Yeah, there. go ahead, Doctor. Uh, this is a question from Dr. Vankhuri. He said, in, we are practicing in rural setup. So are these screws reusable? Sorry, please say. So can we use the pins again uh, after sterilizing is the question. Yes, sir. Can we use the same screws again? Ah, so in another patient after autoclaving it? Yeah, I would think one should inspect the screws. The chance screws one should inspect. If they appear damaged, bent or twisted or, uh, or some way they don't look nice, then throw them away. Don't make a habit of doing it blindly. Uh, after the frame is out, inspect that anything that is looking damaged, discard that and use the newer one. Because uh, if you use it uh, a damaged screw, the function will not be as that good. There would be some drawbacks, there will be some complications. So it's not worth. But on an average, yes, uh, one could use, reuse this screw. We do it all the time. But we make sure that we don't reuse a damaged screw. That we discard. So this is the last question. Yeah, in case of you explain about the rods, two, if you use more number of rods, it improves the stability. So how many rods can we use? How many rods you can use? Uh, well, one is absolutely necessary. There is no question about that. To improve that, you can use two or three rods. Okay. You can use two, but instead of using 
think three rods because then you need a very long pin to apply the rods, which may not be there. You may use a delta frame, a frame in two planes. A unilateral biplanar frame would be even stronger. So you could use that depending on the necessity. And sir, your experience uh, in between choosing between Asculap and uh, AO? My experience is exclusive AO and Hoffman. Hoffman I used for good seven, eight years, and they, this was quite a good system, but uh, that's some time ago. But I've been using AO for a long time, even now. AO is very versatile, very useful. And as you know, we are now not that frequently as we used in 80s and 90s. So whatever that emergency, you know, tied over mass, etc., your system is quite good. SQLM is, of course, I mean, those systems are very good. They are all brilliant engineering pieces. It's what you are used to it. Uh, I'm used to AO systems since 1979. So now nothing else goes in my brain. But uh, Nothing wrong with the SCALAP system. They're fantastic systems. Uh, when she, or some the American systems are very good. And what are your tips for uh, spanning across long for a uh, fractured tibial condyle, say from proximal femur to distal tibia? So, how do you make it a long span? One, I mean, one can span it up as long as required, but then you have to look at the stability of the whole thing. You may add more frames, or you can add biplanar configuration and put cross rods between the two long frames and make it sturdier. This crossbar is a very efficient make uh, efficient way of making things sturdier. The clamp to clamp, uh, as rod to rod clamps, so these are great assets. Before they were invented, we had real trouble. We had to add so many other things. Once those Rod to rod clamps came, uh, life became very easy. Put a crossbar and everything because one more is superior, far more stable. So I would say no harm, put cross rods, put uh, another fixator in a different plane and put a crossbar, things should be stable. One need to react at the situa given situation, but these are a few of the tricks that one can follow. Thank you, Alok. Thank you for uh, putting up all those questions. Now we'll continue with the second part of Sir's lecture. Sir, you can proceed with the next part. Sure. Yeah, please. No problem. So, how do we use this in day to day life? I got a few examples for you. This patient had vascular injury and, uh, and urgent vascular repair had to be done. So it was stabilized in the external fixator, repair was done, and then the debridement was carried out. You can see how it looked very well and the same. We always talk about span, scan, and plan uh, philosophy. And for that, this is a very good device. Uh, once you see a patient like this, the obvious serious trouble with the vascularity, we need to stabilize this, nothing like an external fixator. No splint slab can help. No traction in Thomas splint will be efficient. Nothing but spanning external fixator. That is exactly what's uh, applied here. And you can see it is in two planes. Uh, there are two screws here and a very long rod. It's a little tricky, but uh, still works. Um, you know, I would think this would have been a little down, then it's more stable. It's too close to my liking, but it worked. And then there's a cantilevered rod, but supported here, and this is very good, very close by. So with that, this central part was very well uh, stabilized, and as you can see, the initial X-ray, and now the one reconstituted one is good, and all the required uh, work, soft tissue or vascular work was done in this path. Mainly the soft tissue swelling goes down with the external fixation, then it becomes safer to go in and operate. Much better aligned with less overriding. Initial picture was like this, and you can see, compare these two, and everybody is happy. Uh, distal end femur, and you can see there's a mess there. CT scan, of course, elaborates everything. The lateral side was fixed using plate, and the 
medial side was then fixed in. That's we must use everything that is necessary, what is uh, required and what is good. There was no point putting an external fixer. Oh, today I have my external fixator there. I should put an external fixator here, nothing. This is the safest, stabilest way of holding the fracture together. This gives strength, this recreates that uh, the strong rectangle. Even putting a wire or a nail here is not as sound as putting a plate here. Once you have put the plate, this bone is as good as normal, then you get more support and it works very well. So you have to use all the modalities available. And this the the medial part is stabilized with this with the pin in the calcaneum and two up there. Uh, in this case, uh, there was issues about the uh, this uh, compartment syndrome. So it was released, but because of the external fixator, this could be carried out and patient could go through that. For debridement and whack application, there is nothing like fixator. Without fixators, we cannot do this. We cannot mobilize this in a plaster slab. Even if it is made of resin plaster, we cannot uh, stabilize it the way we can stabilize in this. And it's so convenient for the patient, for doctors, for nurses, everything. So in this situation, it's a God's gift. Now, damage control orthopedics is the current concept, which means the patient uh, to be tied over till his hemodynamically stable. So no, nothing like external fixation. It is simple and quick to apply, provides simplicity in nursing care. Early mobilization of the patient helps addressing severely contaminated wounds, it minimizes the second hit. If you take him to, if you take him to operation theater and do an internal fixation of things, there will be more assault on his body with external fixation, minimum surgical trauma, maximum benefit of stabilization, so patient gets another chance with everything else. For can we use external fixation as definitive for any treatment? Yes, yeah, possible, but there are issues. <clears throat> issues are that pin tag infection is the biggest one. And several methods have been uh, applied for preventing it. Something works, something doesn't work, uh, but that's a major issue with that. You have to put flaps, then the pins come in the way and there could be trouble there. It's inconvenience, large ones, particularly the ring fixators for a very long time. Patients are very apprehensive and they might be difficult to find. And if you do not organize, if you keep it for a long time and do not organize their flexibility, then delayed union and non-union are common. External fixators, when they came into being, the normal Sorbique was non-union machine. And it did happen that a lot of fractures went into non-union because surgeons at that time did not understand the mechanics or the importance of mechanical environment in fracture healing. Uh, they thought stronger they hold, better it is, just eliminating any chance of making any movement at the fracture site. In fact, uh, if there was fracture site, movement and it was bad. So reflected in the general philosophy propagated by AO that you had the compression plating and if you saw in the compression plate a little callous, you were not a surgeon up to the mark or worth the salt. Things have changed because our understanding of fracture healing has changed. Now we appreciate that if there is a movement, there is a callous formation. If there is callous formation, the bone will become stronger earlier, we can get rid of the external fixator or we can mobilize the patient earlier if we see callus. So earlier we used to loathe callus, now we just wait and watch for callus like a chatak. So vacha callus is good. So now we do the flexible tricks. So this is becoming less and less with our understanding of the relative and uh, absolute stability, so this becomes left. And deformities, if you don't manage your external fixator, the patient may land up in iatrogenic deformity, which is not a nice thing. 
but as a temporary bridge to tide over crisis, uh, it is a wonderful thing, a wonderful innovation, invention, and it has saved hundreds of lives. But coming back, can we use external fixation as a definitive treatment for fractures of tibia? Yes, it has been done. And it has been done in the 80s and done well so that journal like Bone and Joint published this paper, which we wrote, which I wrote from Cooper Hospital in 80s to 90s to get a paper published in Bone and Joint was a reason to open champagne. So this was possible. They found truths or they found, uh, everybody thought that, yes, this could be done. Today, this paper may be rejected as doing, being rather cruel to the patient, but that time it was, uh, so it is possible. There are issues. There were about 27% uh, skin infections and 40% uh, had early bone grafting, but that was the topic. So, 40% people had bone grafting there, but it could be treated. These patients had first and last treatment and external fixation. It could be done. However, in radius, it is still valid, and we are doing it day in, day out. My choice today for lower end of radial fracture is plate. If a patient refuses to submit for plating for whatever reason, economic or fear or whatever, then I offer next best I offer is an external fixator, and they do extremely well in this. Uh, deformities are well corrected. One can use some pins or even screws and control the smaller fragment and span them out till they solidify in six weeks time. Only thing they need a little more physiotherapy, a little more time to come back to normalcy. Uh, in plating, by end of three weeks, they are almost forgetting which side was fractured while here. They keep on cursing the doctor for the next six to nine months because they have some trouble or other. But it works. There is no issue about that. This is the ultimate piece that I think of. This lady had bilateral clavicle fractures and this has been treated in external fixator. Uh, this is not my case. I don't even know. I picked it up from, I think I picked it up from that. This amused me and this even, this could be done, but successfully. However, I find this is very cruel to the patient to put it like this for three to six weeks. It's not very nice. <sighs> Pin site infection, how we can take over it? This, uh, my experience is mainly with the uh, fixators on the radius. And it is known that because of the rubbing of the skin and the metal, uh, then the infection starts. It's, uh, if there is a rubbing, there is movement between the skin and the, and the metal of the uh, external fixator pin, then there is discharge, then we get secondary infection, and then the, the loosening, etc., etc. If one is able to stop that rubbing by one way or other, there is never an infection. I have been following this method of between these clamps that I use regularly. Uh, I put down gauze pieces and just go them round and round, round till they become very tight and just hold them with external fixator. Of course, my pin care starts with applying a tincture benzoin seal at the pin uh, skin junction. And when it dries up, it seals the whole thing uh, tight and there is no issue there. And with these two gauze piece rolls, uh, which are tied round and round, I am able to control the movement, and it has worked very satisfactorily. Uh, whole gap is only covered up with uh, this thing. This gentleman is, you can see, is very happy. Uh, I didn't cover up the face for sure that his happiness is wearing this. He also had internal fixation of this type and external fixation. Did well, but he had no skin infection because of these. Uh, method that I have been using. <clears throat> Different patient at three weeks removal is not a head of secretion or nothing, dry skin like that. At six weeks, another patient, uh, no discharge whatsoever, everything looks fine. This is oldest patient uh, in this city, 84 years at six weeks, you can see the 
skin is dry. In fact, once the dressing is applied, I see them regularly at 10 days interval, but do not change unless there is some issue. If there is discharge, I can make out for heart sack, or if there is swell, or patient tells me that there is some kind of discomfort at that side, I do not change the dressing. In fact, I reinforce it with little more gospies to make it more stable and keep it non-mobile skin and curtain well. Six weeks at an elderly patient, no discharge whatsoever. In fact, you can see a scale here, uh, which is very, very dry. <coughs> and those pins, once I removed the pins in, after two weeks, everything healed very, very satisfactorily. Even the fresh one which comes out, is no big deal, um, no big using, nothing. They look very good on that. So my, in my hand, this gauze piece method of packing the space between the clamp and the skin very tightly with wax works very well. That is eliminating the movement between skin and the pin, and that works fine. If, one can find in some different method of stopping that moment, it would be very useful. I never apply any ointment around the skin because that closes the passage. It doesn't allow the charge to come out and doesn't serve any purpose. So, in fact, I apply nothing there. Occasionally, something required soap and water. That's all that is required, nothing else, no disinfectant. No uh, chemicals, nothing. <coughs> How bone heals under external fixator? External fixation facilitates bridge callus. Bridging callus, it, it promotes formation of a lot of callus on either side of the fracture. <coughs> and the mechanics and biology, there are various mechanical biological factors which will affect this thing. And they are affected, but what is also important is what is the health of the surrounding soft tissue. If these soft tissues are damaged extensively, there will be trouble in healing or callus formation or bone healing. But if they are in good shape, the chances are good. The reason being, all the supply line to the bone healing comes through the soft tissue. Supply line is mainly blood vessels. If there is a lot of soft tissue, then there will be a lot of blood vessels and a lot of material building blocks will come from other parts of the body and the bone healing will take place. So mechanical condition is important and the biological factors are also important, the soft tissues are also important. So this is a multifactorial how the fracture will heal under external fixation. After the hematoma, the granulation tissue is covered uh, it, it becomes a little solid and then the cartilage tissue forms there. As the time goes on, the cartilage changes to endochondral bone and then <clears throat> endochondral thing would uh, go on to uh, lay down hydroxyapatite and will make a bone and will become solidified, which is a standard procedure which all we know. Commutated fractures will tolerate some moment to a larger degree than a transverse fracture. Transverse fracture, one has to be more careful that they do not tolerate much movement. So you have to adjust your frames more accurately while in combination uh, is more tolerant and could handle better. Why? <clears throat> in transverse fracture, there are two units only where the healing is continuing, healing is taking place. If the movement, say, load of about <clears throat> 40 nm is applied, that 40 mm is breaking one single tenuous um, point where the healing was taking place, this movement then broke. So there's nothing to fall back. <clears throat> so transverse fracture, the healing is likely to be delayed because of smaller movement. <clears throat> In commutated fracture, it's a different story. There are various interfaces where healing is occurring. You can see various ways between any two pieces, healing is occurring. So we apply the same deforming load as we apply to transverse uh, fracture. Then not all the load would be applied to one face. Some will be applied here, some will be applied here, some will be here, some will be here. So the applied destabilizing load will be at different places. 
So its intensity on each healing point would be less. So it will tolerate instability more than a transverse fracture. And that's why the commutated fractures heal faster than a transverse fracture. <clears throat> Mechanical environment is the real thing now. Of course, we need the, the cells, uh, the progenital cells, which will form the bone. We also need the scaffolding in which will, they will act. We also need the chemical stimuli, which come and which come from the other parts of the body and tell the bone, tell certain cells to produce, now produce granulation, now produce cartilage, now produce bone. That's all chemical uh, messengers up there, and that is established that we understand. What we now understand is that the mechanical environment also has a large uh, role to play. The body understands whether the uh, whether the, the bone is moving or not moving. If it is moving too much, then the healing does not play. So mechanical environment is also important and is now being acknowledged more and more. <clears throat> but the, some moment is necessary, and we have repeatedly used the terms two to 12%. If the moment at the fracture side is between two to 12%, then there will be abundant amount of callus formation because that kind of moment stimulates the cells and all the other mechanisms to make more and more callus. Similarly, if the load application is cycling on a regular basis, then there is a higher formation of callus. Like uh, when we tell patients to put his foot on a weighing machine and apply a regulated load of few kilos several times a day, it is cyclic loading. If he is walking with partial weight bearing, it is cyclic loading. And this will stimulate the bone formation. But if you make the frames very tight with tightening the nuts, then it will reduce the movement of the fracture side and less gas will be formed. So overall, one requires some movement at the fracture side to get a callus. And seeing callus is our greatest desire when we want to apply external healing. <coughs> Moment is fine, but the magnitude and direction of the applied load or the force on the fragment are important. Magnitude is that is the amount you apply less load or full load of the body or partial load of the body. And in the direction in which it is applied, it is also important the type of fracture and the fracture geometry. Type of fracture is a compound fracture with a lot of soft tissue it is going to take place. If it's a closed fracture, it is going to form callus faster. Fracture geometry we just now considered is a comminuted fracture. It will heal faster because it tolerates more movement. Also, fracture will heal a little slowly. But if there is a very large gap, then it will heal only after a certain inter intervention by the surgeon will not heal by itself. So what is the magnitude and direction required? External stability is the most important. <coughs> the actual uh, interfragmentary movement is of three types. The axial one, axial uh, interfragmentary movement is most productive as far as the bone formation is concerned. And it enhances uh, it produces fibrocartilage and vascular deformity. But if the actual moment is in excess, then the ability of the tissue to form the bone and remodel reduces. So we like actual instability or actual moment, but to a limited uh, level. What is that uh, threshold where it will turn a good person to a bad person is difficult to say but micro motion is required there. But when the actual instability is more, uh, the remodeling capacity goes away. So though the tissue is forming, it is not being shaped, it is not being remodeled. So what we get is hypertrophic non-union. 
when axial instability is more so than excessive axial movement then you get hypertrophic non union so type of loading is important uh, just to recapitulate the movements are of three types axial shear and translational when there is excessive axial movement at the fracture site we get hypertrophic non union if we get translational shear at the fracture site that means side to side movement we are not able to control the side to side movement then atrophic non union occurs in reverse if you see atrophic non union you must look for translational shear forces that are stopping from fracture to heal and nullify them so it's a indication that fracture tell that we need to look at the um, shear force what happens is cartilage is formed in excess its vascular to demolish because of the translation fair uh, and the mineralization does not uh, take place what i am trying to put that the process of healing doesn't die down it is active but because forces are such it is not able to do what it should be doing and this is where the mechano biologics comes in you we usually use uh, external fixator in very bad cases 3b or 3b or 4 something like this they are already damaged there is a lot of severity tissue the periosteum is destroyed and the injury as such to other parts of the body is severe there could be other medical conditions that could harm the fracture union just because we applied fracture external fixing we cannot say this non union is gone because of this we have to consider the other things external fixing is many more but the other things can make it difficult so every instance of failed union you should not expect to be now dynamization uh, what dynamization does is this converts the static fixator into a flexible one thus person permitting some movement at the fracture site and it also then allows the passage of control forces across the fracture to convert it into a beneficial axial movement we just now discussed that if the axial benefit axial movement is beyond that certain critical level it will stop it will produce a a hypertrophic non union so we want it to move but within the limits so that it can be beneficial to us <clears throat> i am if increases at the fracture site um what happens is the cortical contact is improved and the fracture becomes more stable and it becomes wider with callus it becomes more stable so it is more mechanically sound so the next stage remodeling stage can take place whole idea of following the callus is to reduce the movement to such a level that the remodeling take place no fracture fixation no fracture healing is complete and this remodeling has taken place so what means we see callus it is only half a house <clears throat> now how we can do this telescoping how we can dynamize this in an external fixator by loosening the clamps or loosening the pins Uh, we consider all those facts which will make a fixator more stronger like adding more rods or adding more uh, moving the part uh, closer to the skin or further away from the using one of those techniques we can make the external fixator more pliable so that there could be desired movement at the fracture site so loosening the clamps reducing the span increasing the distance uh, reducing the number of the rods all these are the methods which we can use for dynamization of an external fixator <laughs> more callus means size increases stiffness increases strength increases larger load can be taken by the bone and once the bone starts taking the load of the body load of the limb then it is less carried on the implant the implant becomes stiffer uh, safer and will last longer so that is what we desire so that once the load is more we can make external fixators 
nature siphon to restore cortical contact, so remodeling can take place. As I said, the callus formation, the nature siphon to restore the cortical contact. The cortical healing takes place by cutting the cones and the osteo, osteophytes, not osteophytes, osteocytes walking through the sternal to the distal end. Then the direct healing, direct repair takes place. For that, it requires absolute stability. It requires cortical contact. Then the remodeling takes place. The remodeling takes place. That is the end of the fracture healing. So it's a process in which callus has an important role and all our efforts should be to produce callus at the fracture site by whatever means, internal or external, so that the final stage nature can do by remodeling. This callus formation is called by as a secondary contact healing. Callus is broader in the world. The translational share which can produce the uh, and the non-union the different kind uh, is reduced and callus can mature for more uh, the same. The drawbacks of dynamization, the law, the frame stability is lost and one could have interfragmentary motion movement of the bad time, the shear. Shear forces promote formation of fibrous tissue and at the fracture side. See, the mechanobiology is a study of, of forces on a cell. Now, it has been worked out that if a cell uh, receives a tensile force and it will produce a certain kind of products, if it faces a compressive force, it will produce some different kind of material. If it is going to shear mode, it will produce a third kind. If there is a translational, it will behave differently. The loading or the forces working on the cell modify the working of the cell or the output of the cell. A study of all this is mechanobiology, which is very interesting and a very new subject. By altering the pressures, now it is possible to modify the function of a particular cell, not only bone, but other areas also, and a lot of lead is going happening in there. Very interesting thing, but that is what is we need to know. <coughs> uh, if dynamization is applied after the bridging callus, once you see some kind of callus, you dynamize, then it will expedite the callus formation. But if it is applied, if it is dynamized, if this frame is weakened before you see any kind of callus formation, then non-union will occur. So before dynamizing, one must wait and watch that bridging callus is seen. Once the callus is seen, we can dynamize it. It will expedite the formation. What stage this could be done is debatable and one can argue on both sides. One has to use his judgment and a little bit of luck and then proceed with dynamization. <clears throat> Whether it helps excellence also and what time if you do it helps all um, still wishy-washy. Um, starting and dynamic on weight bearing there is progressive closure of the fracture. The losing the bar side of the other, that will like so these are the methods of producing dynamizers. You can loosen the clamps, you can activate the telescoping uh, knob of the body on the fixator, or reduce the bone distress. So this I have discussed recently. Open bone stress and prolong the life of the fence. This is all process. <clears throat> these are raised between bone healing and the pin bone interface. Uh, sooner the callus formation occurs, lesser is the load on the pin bone interface, and longer is the conjunctivity. So, one should remember that the pins can fail at the pin, pin bone interface there. Reverse dynamization is a new concept. And when there is some callus formation, we loosen it. Scientists have said that if you keep the fixator loose in the initial three, two to four weeks and then tighten it after four weeks, 
then more calysis formation. Their argument is that in the initial stage, the limb requires more movement so that the stimulus to the mechanical stimulus to produce callus uh, starts the entire machinery rolling in the first two to four weeks. The hematoma formation and the soft callus formation it is expedited because of the movements. That should be allowed. Once that is done, then when it comes to cartilage in a stage, that is about three to four weeks, you tighten that and then you are, you are set for healing very faster. And you can do it with ordinary external fixators, but a special external fixator has been devised. Uh, uh, Slobodan Tepic is the scientist who has uh, made this fixator. What happens here, the first way you apply this external, this is a plastic thing, and uh, uh, these are applied in several ways. And at four weeks, uh, a small metal piece is inserted in these two, uh, these two uh, pins or by the side of the pins that reduce that improves the stability of tremendous. It makes it more stable. So all that requires is uh, putting a metal piece here and here at the stipulated time and changes the stiffness of this thing. It's a very versatile thing, uh, but not many clinical trials have been done. Uh, it's available now and. Uh, if anybody wants to conduct a research on this reverse dynamization, I can help them to get this uh, thing uh, either economically or, in fact, freely. Uh, Solon image is well known to me. He is prepared to give this if somebody wants to conduct a proper uh, program, and this is possible. Uh, it's a very interesting sub uh, concept, and it's catching up. However, at this moment, there are not many clinical uh, uh, trials and somebody who's listening, if is interested, uh, one can help them to get this specialized fixator, which can make the matters very easy. <sighs> Two to four of weeks of low stiffness to allow IFM, then stiffen the fixator. Abandon callus formation happens. Fixator in those trials, fixator could be removed at 11 weeks as compared to the normal ones when it took 22 weeks. In half the time healing occurred, that's why fixes it could be. Interesting concept when you try that out, but some hard work is required. Um, possible clinical application that after calysis in interfragmentary screw could be applied to improve the stability. Now, if this is done in diaphysis, it often fails, but it could work in the metaphysis region. Uh, the diaphysis does not work in metaphysis. This could work, and that can be tried. This is one rare example I'm showing uh, here. After the initial uh, the callus was formed, this uh, this olive wire was removed, and two screws were passed, and the fracture led to union. But in multiple cases, it has failed, and it should not be done. Recently, we saw this new application, strain reduction. Uh, this was plated, and there was a hypertrophic non-union. And the proposal is to improve the stability uh, by these screws, which is reverse dynamization, making it more stable after callus is formed and healing does take place. This we have discussed last time, and uh, it's a very interesting paper that we should do. Uh, such situation, certainly one can do screws and improve this. Development. Limited internal fixation with external fixation is, is experimental. It's, uh, timing is everything. When to do this is difficult. Don't do it in the, in the, uh, in the metaphysical region, but it may work in, in the diaphysical region, but it may work in the metaphysical region. Now, lastly, we come to distraction of stereogenesis. How come when we compress, uh, if we, there's non-union, we compress. If we pull the pieces apart, we still get bone union. And uh, how this happens? It is all because of the mechanobiologics. The cells will respond differently to the different stresses and strains that are inflicted on them. And that is the new science that we orthopedic surgeons should come up. 
mechanical induction of new bone when two bone surfaces are pulled apart is called the uh, this, uh, uh, this is called tension stress effect which Elizaro himself named that if you pull these two apart then bone is uh, formed. The bone formation is in parallel co parallel columns from the central interzone. You can see the the bone formation starts from here and spreads to the other end. This happens because of a physis like thing uh, which generates somewhere uh, at two ends and then works up from here. But the, the recruitment of cells is at the intermediate zone. Most of the cells come from the periosteum or from the blood vessels. Multipotent cells are recruited, which then they turn into fibroblasts, then later into osteoblasts. And when abundant callus is formed, they turn into osteocytes and live there uh, for good. So <clears throat> cells come from periosteum under distraction of induced tension, the fibroblast elongates and, and the direction of the distraction. Even if the direction of distraction is at right angles to the um, long axis of the bone, it will still form the callus. So if you want to expand the bone, one can give a transfer traction and get a thicker bone, if possible. In mandible, they do this all the time. In uh, orthopedics, we are not doing it. In mandible, they increase the thickness by doing a distraction technique. When the fibroblasts and collagen fibers uh, also in, uh, laid down nearby, as you can see, the small amount of bone formation is happening all the time here. It all starts from here and goes down along the Fibroblasts change their role and become osteoblasts, then they deposit osteoids, then osteoblasts become osteocytes. That means by stage by stage become more mature and then they become normal bone cells. This is the histological picture. These are the collagen fibers which are laid down in the vicinity of the blood vessel. And the, after collagen fibers are formed, then the hydroxyapatite crystal is formed, laid down on that. Then it becomes more solid and solid. The ossification starts at the two ends and then comes toward the center. So the maturity comes from the two ends and ultimately the intermediate zone, into zone that becomes ossified. <sighs> Mature occurs away from the zone, gradually crosses the inner zone, bone matures quickly. It's quick. Uh, it doesn't go through the cartilaginous process. The normal fracture healing callus will, the granulation will become, first become cal, cal, cartilaginous, then it will be ossified. In distraction from, from uh, granulation, it will straight go to ossification. Cartilage formation does not happen. That means Nature has made a shortcut for healing, uh, which is advantageous for surgeons. It omits the stage of cartilage formation, hence it's quicker. Distraction works in all other tissues. Vascular channels are abundant bone tissues. Form vascular patterns similar to the natural bone healing. Muscles, ligaments, and tendons, they all get stretched along with this. Neurovascular structure is slow and more sensitive, so one has to be more careful. Similarly, fascia, tendons, and dermis, when the skin can be stretched and expanded like that. The rhythm of distraction, distraction rate and rhythm are important. If you do it too slowly, uh, it stops healing. If you do it too fast, it breaks down. So it has been worked out that one millimeter a day leads to a satisfactory bone formation. And this distraction should be done in divided doses at at four times a day is the most optimal if you are doing it manually. If one can do it continuous by motors, then it is more successful. Also, the factors that will help distraction in osteogenesis is the way you carry out the osteotomy. If you preserve the periosteum, if you preserve the medullary contents and the soft tissue vascularity, then it will be more beneficial will produce more callus in a shorter time. Complete, instead of doing complete corticotomy, three-fourth or three-eighth corticotomy in the last portion should be done osteoclasis. In TBI, the posterior portion should be osteoclast. 
so that there is enough hematoma formation without damage and we get favorable lesion. We compress the bones, it again reduces the instability of the fracture and the process of direct contact healing starts. The bone perceives that now there is no more movement and it is in contact, is perfectly reduced. Then the osteocytes, uh, osteoclasts will go there and the osteocytes then go inside and form a new portion. So compression and, and destruction both will produce, but the process of forming bone is different. So there should not be any surprise because there are two different ways the bone is. The final product is same, but the way it is done is different. So that's why we get a compression osteosynthesis, also distraction osteosynthesis. In both instances, what is important is stable fixation. Both will work uh, by <coughs> distraction compression, bone facilitate bone formation by endosteum, bone marrow, and the periosteum. That means all the three sides require stability to form bone, and that is what is wrong. Whether we use ring or monotube uh, distractors, it doesn't really matter. Both are efficient. And both will produce the same results, only you must know how to use it. It is the man behind the tube or the ring that matters, not the apparatus itself. So that will comes to a conclusion, but I want to thank Dr. Vikas Agassi for lending me a lot of clinical material for today's talk. <laughs> and what I have to say that I have not been able to control uh, cover entire aspect of external fixation, which is difficult. It becomes boring for you as well as me. Because well, the lecture only provides us a fleeting opportunity to make a point. I made some point which should be useful, particularly the direction in which to apply your external fixation, particularly in TBI, is important. And if you follow that line, uh, it would be very useful. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for uh, providing insight into all this uh, yeah. about external fixator. Uh, any comments you want to make or any question, Dr. Saxena, sir, you want to ask? Yeah, in the second part of the <clears throat> talk, he mainly mentioned about the infection uh, at the pin site and also the dynamization part. So, as far as the infection is concerned, you know, my way of preventing it was like this. So, I would like to suggest. That one is that when you introduce a pin, the skin incision should be quite liberal. If you put a pin in a very tight manner in the skin, then it definitely will get enlarged and the infection chances are there. So a liberal uh, sort of incision while putting a pin or a wire as I do it in Alizaro. As far as the uh, dressing is concerned, he, he suggested a very nice way of putting gauze all around the pin and all. What we do or I do, is that put a rubber cap, which is available from the wires, injection wires, and that is mounted over the wire. And that is taken up to the skin. And in between, we put a, just a betadine gauze or a simple gauze and that take care of the uh, dressing. So that's a very, very easy way of putting a dressing in the Elizaro especially, even around the other fixators where the pins are going inside, this sort of dressing can be done. Now, as far as the dynamization is concerned, the very, uh, as you also said, that the very principle of the Elizaro was is the destruction osteosynthesis because he used for lengthening of the bone, this particular fixator. And there he realized that when you distract the bone, it has a capacity to form more bone. But there he insisted on the continuity of the periosteum. And therefore, as you suggested, incomplete corticotomy, keeping the peri periosteal tube intact, by sort of doing a last part of the one fourth circumference by osteoclysis, all that is very important. Now, not only that distraction and compression leads to better, better union, <clears throat> it is also the, it changes the electrical impulses at the site of healing. And that is very important for callus formation. At one time, electrical stimulation was being used to promote the callus. 0.2 uh, milliampere current used to be there. Dr. Satyanand worked on this very in a very large manner. 
and this sort of electrical change in the electrical impulses when the tensile force are applied or distraction force are applied the electrical impulses at the site are different and when the compression is applied the electrical impulses are different now as far as the mo micro mobility is concerned the axial micro mobility that is along the axis of the diaphyseal diaphysis or the long bone is beneficial whereas mm -hmm. the transitional or side to side mobility is dangerous so that care should be taken that when you distract and compress it should be along the axis of the bone yeah. and that is that leads to a better better calibration and better healing thank, thank you. you thank you sir alok uh, yes, there will be questions we'll take up the questions yeah sir uh, professor punkar sir from amravati he is asking in compound fractures short oblique fractures can we do interfragmentary fixation and then apply as a uh, expect as a neutralization mode no no you should not do that <clears throat> you should not apply a, a fragment that is sure way of causing trouble um, if you are applying only as a temporary fixation external fixation is fine um, but don't apply into fragmentary screw uh, that is detrimental to final healing one should not do that okay sir so next question yeah Sir, how is lag applied in case of external fixators? Lag, lag, lag application in case. He is asking about how to apply lag in association with external fixator, especially if pins are very near the uh, surgical. Yeah, sir, so that requires a little planning on the part of surgeon. Um, when you apply it first time, you should envisage what is going to come there. In that case, um, you have put the pins in different direction, different place also into the flow through the area. It's not going to work. But if uh, things have gone wrong and you are coming right in the center of the back area, you can remove the pins and put them through another area. Thirdly, I think uh, if one can create this vacuum around the pin by applying those sticky stuff. Even back around that, it is not going to cause any trouble. I know direct experience for this, but Dr. Chandak might be able to help us. Uh, can we apply the hack back uh, back uh, foam around the pin, and will it work? Yeah, we have tried that, and even the back machine, the KCI, have a special ah. taping uh, material available for sealing around the pins, and uh, that is made available to us, and we can apply back on those pins also. However, most of the times the pins are away from the uh, actual fracture zone or the raw area, and then you can seal the border. Even if you have one inch of border, that is good enough to seal. There is another an interesting question from a surgeon who says, if fixator is stable, the fracture configuration is stable, and non-union is there, will it heal with bone grafting alone? <coughs> fixator and bone grafting alone. Yeah. So a fracture which is initially yeah, treated by. Then you do bone grafting and hope for the best. Yeah. One would like to analyze the level of the stability at the fracture site. Why it has gone for non-union? Uh, that one needs to analyze and see uh, if there are any hints like hypertrophic or atrophic, and depending on work out what is the level of instability. If there is no infection, most likely the non-union has occurred because of the instability. If you control the instability, then it will heal without any problem. Uh, it's very rarely that the outside material by way of bone grafting is required as a stimulus. The main trouble is uh, the stability. So one should think in those terms, reduce the stability to the beneficial level of food and and healing would occur even without bone graft. But uh, as it is traditional, applying bone graft, I would say reduce, I mean, make it stable and then apply bone graft, uh, both will work. Look, we have questions. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Question from Gwalior. When to remove the external fixator in compound injuries after seeing the callus, initial callus is seen? When to remove? <laughs> See, once you are happy that patient can take the load of the limb and the body, then you can remove it. 
with a minimal callus, uh, then you want to remove and move to another area like external support in the plaster, or you want to put a plate or a rod inside. That's the next stage. Unless full callus uh, is formed where the the bone can take full load of the limb and the body, one cannot remove that. Uh, so one has to judge from place place, either shift to another method or make sure that there's abundant callus and you are sure that uh, bone has healed, then you can remove it immediately. Yeah. So it will yeah. depend what you see on the X-ray. Yeah. Look, we can take up the next yes. question. Yeah. Yes, sir. So in one of your examples, you have showed in proximal tibial fractures, you use a spanning fixator. So why not use a skeletal traction from calcaneum? Will it serve the same purpose or not? Why not use calcaneal pins, is it? Yeah, skeletal yeah. traction. For, for spanning x fix instead of a... Instead of spanning x fix Oh, instead of spanning, you put a skeletal traction. Yeah, for, I mean, this is for initial one to one and a half weeks or say two weeks. So why not uh, put a skeletal traction? Uh, in present scenario, one has to be really sadist to put a calcaneal traction and confine the patient to bed. Mobility is a stake. One would any day uh, put an external fixator and keep the patient mobile in bed or outside with external fixator and not resort to skeletal traction through calcaneum, through anything. Right. You, mobility is the main thing. Uh, Aristotle said life is movement. And Eo yeah. said movement is life. So uh, these days, a modern orthopedic surgeon should not think of uh, a calcaneal traction for two weeks and put the patient there. No, no, not. Go ahead, Alok. You have questions, no? Yes, sir. So, yeah. uh, uh, the surgeon wants to know your worst complication with external fixator. Sorry. The so, worst. Yeah, the worst complication you ever face with the external fixator? Many complications. So to say one is uh, one was worse than the other. Every complication is worse. Only. But um, the infection, see one patient I remember in which it was in very early days, the injury wasn't all that bad. But by putting in an external fixator, we produced non-unions and then it all got infected and then we had to do several other things to get it right and hook up and ultimately ended up with an amputation. <laughs> but I was, it was very early days of uh, using external fixation. The complications could be very severe and the worst could be uh, an amputation there. But with more understanding of the these things, this complication don't occur there. I was on the amputation, but that was we had just started working on external fixation. In fact, we didn't know that we need to put in a pilot colon and put the thread, uh, put the Steinman pin. We're trying to put a blunt Steinman pin through the hard young TV. I was only 35. So all kinds of mistakes. So but that ended in amputation. I can't forget that even till today. Yeah. Hello, we can, yeah, we can take. Yeah, sir, sir, can, can you uh, have some light on the complications in external fixator? Yeah, <clears throat> there are a number of complications, right, from the pin tract infection, etc. But then, the during the surgery, the complication which can occur is injury to the vital structures, which, although the percentage is very, very low, but then the injury does occur, and therefore, one should be very thorough with the anatomy of the limb in that area to avoid injury to the neurovascular structure. Then later on, when the fixator is kept for a longer duration, the contractures in the soft tissue occur. For example, when it is applied to the tibia, the equinus deformity can occur, which can of, of course be prevented by putting another wire in the metatarsal and then connecting it to the uh, ring, the distal ring to prevent the uh, plantar flexion or in the limb going into the equinus. So the soft tissue contracture is another complication where the bone is surrounded by soft tissue, especially in the humerus and the femur, the quadriceps, etc. contractures are well known. 
or the uh, fibrosis of these muscle is well known and therefore the mobility will get affected at the later date so these are some of the complication which uh, we have noticed and this should be yeah thank you very much hello mm -hmm. we can take up not the next question yes sir so there was a comment whether tincture benzoin which you use around the pin would it cause collection underneath the skin because it will seal the area um tincture benzoin say the important point is relaxing the skin all around the pin as dr saxena just mentioned especially uh, when i pass the pins i make sure that there is no tension in the skin any time and just to close that wound i find tincture benzoin is very effective it sticks to the pin it also sticks to the skin it also helps in reducing the movement between at the interface so i always use it and uh, so far no side effects of that no bad effects in fact and uh, with my method uh, usually there is no oozing works very well sir uh, can i ask do you this do this for upper limb and lower limb both or only for upper limb mostly for radius ulna fixators yes, and uh, in tbr now after that paper got published i stopped using external fixator for a very long time yes, it short time things don't go that bad if there is a compound so we now tend to change it over to something else but uh, the trick works even in lower limb as well one which i had treated for about 8 years ago in external fixation from beginning to end Uh, I use the same method, and there was no infection. But honestly, the long-term use of uh, pin and rod extend fixator for tibia has reduced to quite. Short-term use yes, is many. Yeah. Can. Yes, sir. Can Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, this is really good to use a tincture benzoin because initially we don't expect any discharge from the pin site, and there at that time when the tincture benzoin is applied around the pin. and further sort of serious discharge does not take place then it is a very good procedure but once the serious discharge starts then it's no good to seal the area then there should be a porous dressing from where the discharge can come out right yes thank you sir sir right. yeah. sir here in your two examples you showed on fracture compound humerus and proximal tibia how did you manage later on did you shift to another modality of treatment Which uh, ones they are referring to? Two examples. Two examples you showed on one was on sharp humerus compound wound and another was on proximal tibia. Sharp got type six. Ah, uh, so, uh, we want to discuss treatment of those. No sir, did you shift to another modality of treatment later on? Was that the final way of management, or you shifted yeah. to another modality? See. Uh, I there are borrowed cases. I have not followed them up. Okay. I just put them up only for external fixator. How that can be used? So go into the details would be. I mean, I am not competent to do that. Okay. But they are not my cases. I don't know the history. What happened later? Right. But sir, in those cases, can we manage them on X fix only, or should we go to other other modality? Yeah, sir, your term. experience. <sighs> See, long term management on the pin and uh, clamp fixator is difficult. one would like to switch on to as a choice one would like to switch on to something else in the ring fixer yeah. this is possible hello uh, yes sir yes sir please uh, metaphyseal fracture the hybrid fixators are more um, uh, advantage give more advantage especially when you are talking about the metaphysis the um, uh, fracture at the end of the bone the hybrid fixators are more useful than the other fixators okay yeah thank you sir thank you so that was all the questions the, all we have finished the question yes sir yeah, uh, alok uh, in your experience uh, how is external fixator in current scenario you are uh, using sir, for any definitive treatment sir i am using for uh, <laughs> for uh, yeah lrs i am using lrs and for this uh, comp uh, distraction new experiences we are using for that and even for the, we are using hto fixator for correcting the uh, medial compartment osteoarthritis we are oh, using it okay but the use of external fixator is really valuable in all compound fracture management 
yes and, and as as an initial span scan philosophy yes. that is really useful so learning about all those integrity about putting pins stabilizing the fracture getting the distraction getting in a stable mode uh, uh, allowing for soft tissue procedure are the real advantages yes. now uh, a look who is listening as a student he wants to summarize uh, okay. the uh, what he has learned so a look uh, yeah, allow please sir please yeah go ahead abhinav can you can you please summarize what you have learned uh, good e- good evening respected faculty uh, it was nice hearing you uh, it was a nice lecture about external fixator and it cleared a lot of uh, concept of mine uh, regarding external fixator uh, the concept of tapered screw and radial screw uh, radial loading was really nice to know and it was nice to know about the uh, how the pins load and how dif- they deform the bone then uh, so you talked to be- as well about uh, mod- use of modular fixator for reduction as well as fixation and then after that uh, we should be a- able to uh, before applying a external fix- fixator we should always understand the deformity and the plane in which the deformity is occurring so that we can plan the fixator and get a good uh, reduction in fixation uh so then uh, next point was about importance of external fixator in a uh, uh damage control in a scenario of damage control orthopedic for uh, span scan and plan condition uh thank you sir for uh, clearing us the important step of bone healing and the biomechanical environment required for them and it was really no, uh, nice to know the uh, uh, understand the and the principles of dynamization and distraction osteogenesis with the help of external fixator uh, thank you sir thank you, uh, thank you. For, for a wonderful lecture thank you abhinav and it is pleasing uh, really pleasing to note that a young mind is also dynamized with a external fixator mm-hmm. alok uh, would you like to summarize for all practitioners and the usage of external mm-hmm. fixator sir's principles yeah yeah Sir, sir, I'd uh, like Abhinav has covered most of the point, but sir was very clear about using edge coated pins uh, in osteoporotic. That was a wonderful idea. Then he also told us about the dynamization, how to use multiple rods. I mean, two or three, even delta frame application. That was fantastic, sir. And then uh, there was a concept of stress reduction screws, which he had highlighted in the previous uh, talk also on the stress reduction. Stress, stress, stress reduction. reduction. Yeah. yeah. then also then he told about the new concept of reverse dynamization i mean that was beautifully explained about the interfragmentary compression the reverse dynamization then the uni- uniplanar multiplanar uh, fixators use of them and the principle followed is span scan and plan that was a fantastic talk thank you alok thank you very much and uh, after listening to that reverse dynamization many would jump on his email id <laughs> yes. to get uh, hold of certain study materials thank you sir for offering that and uh, definitely many many upcoming uh, uh, lecturers and pg students would like to do a research on that if that uh, helps them in their institute and thanks for bringing it up ashok are you uh, online i ashok, think sir is not there I, ashok is not there no yeah, yeah. so so i think all good uh, yeah goji and all good sessions have to come to an end um uh, yeah. it's our time to thank uh, professor thakur for bringing us this series on tuesday afternoon post graduate students and all of us practitioners also look forward to this series this series specially helps us in understanding the principles and understanding principles is a hallmark for progress in orthopedics so it is really good alok we are associated with this uh, uh, webinar next tuesday he has agreed yes. to bring in uh, tension band wiring principles and other yes. pot query to help us out understanding certain things in orthopedics yeah go ahead alok please come sir jcu thanks uh, dr saxena sir also for being on board yes yes yeah. saxena sir has put in lot of his sir, sir, experience, experience. Been... yeah so we, we are really thankful to dr saxena sir that he spared his time and is available for his expert comment uh, anything sir uh, you want to uh, thakur sir you want to say something Yeah, I thought uh, today's presentation. I was quite excited about those uh, 
planes of inserting the uh, monofix setters in the line of the uh, loading. That is a concept which I gathered only for your lecture. Before that, I wasn't aware. I thought that's a very good uh, concept that we analyze which side the load affected the fracture. And depending on the triangular part of the butterfly, you can judge it and then place the stabilizer in the plane of the uh, offending load. I thought that was very good. If, uh, if when in the emergency room, if you put it in different directions, you will be doing a better service to the patient rather than just blindly putting it on the anterior medial side, which is the easiest way to do it. And surely most of us would remember that beam getting compressed from top and creating a wedge onto the top layer and bending uh, in a distraction onto the other side. That would be well remembered for a long, long time. That was really very well efficiently explained and that picture would remain in our eyes. Alok, you wanted yeah. to say something and then... Yeah, we'll... that's it. Yeah, that, that's Thank all. you so much. Sachana, yeah. sir, you want to say something at the end of this session? Nein, this was a good session. Most of the principles of the external fixer fixator has been very nicely explained, and I have really enjoyed the webinar. So, friends, we'll be again meeting on next Tuesday, 28th of April at 2:30 p.m. to be back with uh, Professor Thakur, who would be teaching us about the tension band wiring principles and a lot of other things. If you have anything special to ask him, uh, his mail ID is already given, or you can uh, put. A uh, WhatsApp message to Dr. Alok Umre or to me, and uh, you can ask any specific thing you want to get cleared on that topic because most likely that would be the last webinar on this theme during this lockdown period. However, he'll be available for his comments later on also. He has given his uh, acceptance of availability for clearing principle. So let us wait for next Tuesday. We'll be back on Tuesday at 2 30. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Thakur sir. Thank you, Alok. Thank you, Sachana sir. Thanks, Avina, for summarizing. And we all enjoyed this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ashok, Ashok, you are there. Any yeah, question? Yes, sir. Yeah, any, any, any question you had in between? We just wanted if you have on your mail because uh, Alok uh, could took a uh, lot of questions. So if you have anything particular. No, I think Alok has covered. Alok has covered. Yeah. So thank, thank you, Ashok, so much for uh, providing this platform. And it's a wonderful medium for learning. And all, yes. uh, all the students and sir, all one, the... Sir, sir, there's one question from Funkar, sir, from Amravati. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, sir would be gracious uh, enough to ask. Yeah. yeah. Sir, definitive surgery, after how many days, after keeping x fix for say, how many days we can do, go ahead with a definitive surgery? So he's asking about compound fracture. You initially do a x fix yeah. And then when do we plan a definitive surgery? Yes, sir. Any comment, Thakur sir, is your experience? That would depend on the situation. No, it cannot put a rule of law that uh, in 10 days time, the general statement is as soon as possible, as soon as it is feasible to get rid of that and switch on to something else. That is what one would like to do. But to put down in 10 days, 15 days, sooner you do, lesser are the complications. If you keep the external pieces for a longer time, then one may have to wait in between as a change of period, remove the external fixator, use some other uh, immobilizer, and then go for the internal fixation. But if one is able to get on uh, with other things within two weeks' time, then there is no need for a lay down period. You can remove the external fixator and use the internal fixators or nail or whatever and straight away. So no hard and fast statement, but uh, working on the condition that is available. So another question was there from Dr. Jaswinder Patna. Yeah, go ahead, Alok. Sir would be ready to answer that with yeah, his after, consent. Yeah, after how many days can we still do distraction in a patient who has stopped doing it for some reason? Ah, uh, for that... Uh, <laughs> If you have stopped for a very long time, then the whole process has stopped, stabilized, starting distraction is not going to work. Then you will have to do the entire procedure again because all these methods, all these movements, uh, the reactions in body are time bound. 
there is no indefinite time that the bone healing unit will keep on working. It works for a while and then it stops. So for some reason you have stopped uh, distracting, uh, then you have to start all over again. Uh, maybe do the uh, uh, corticotomy and again, start the waiting period and then start all those things. <clears throat> So another question by Dr. Singh, Dr. Jaspinder from Patna. What are the options for poor regenerate after about six months in Elizaro apparatus in tibia? Poor regenerate after six months? Yes, sir. What are the options? Options for uh, improving the regenerate is what he is asking. Yeah. yeah. The first option is to really... Uh, think and analyze why it has taken such a long time. Uh, all these things should finish in a stipulated three, four reasonable time. Six months is a very long time. So something must be making it unstable. Uh, if there is infection, that has to be taken care of. If there is instability, that has to be taken care of. And then go on producing these things. Again, I find it difficult to give a concrete answer on the hypothetical situation, which is only half told. What you have told me is just that it has not been there for six months. But tell me other things. What is the injury? Where it is? How bad is the skin? How bad is the patient? All those things matter. It's multifactorial. To say, yeah. you do yeah. this and you will be all right is not true. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, Alok, for taking up those questions at the end also. So the Ashok, uh, you are there. I think, yeah. I'm here, sir. Yeah. So, any any final instructions from your side? Next Tuesday, you are allowing us this platform. Yes, yes, platform. absolutely, sir. So, this is port... time reserved for Dakur, sir. Yeah. So, it's a potpourri on next Tuesday at 2.30. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can we, can, Ashok, can we uh, put it a bit early so that uh, today's experience was uh, some people could not know in time? So, okay. can we put it a bit early? So sure, can sure. We can put a bit students up. and all the young. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. We'll do that next time. That yeah. Time. Thank you on count. Thank you very much once again, everyone. Yeah. And uh, this meeting comes to an end. How early do you want to do it? Two hour, two uh, two thirty is all right. No, no, no the to... information. Right. Oh, information. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. I thought the timing you want to move. No, timing, timing is, is convenient. Two thirty is convenient. convenient. All right, thank you very much. I enjoyed meeting you all. And all that happened was I couldn't watch any Netflix for last four days. <laughs> yes, I do realize making up of this slides requires a lot of attention and lot of money. But yeah. this is more enjoyable than Netflix. Yes. <laughs> Preparing yeah, the lecture is more enjoyable than doing the Netflix bit. Yeah. Best thank stimulus you. for our mind is academics, and yes, it, it does stimulate. So, thank you very much. And of course, we have other time to do other activities. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, taking those questions at the end, also. Thank you. Bye for now. Yeah. So, we'll, we'll, we'll come to an end with this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>